Good evening. Welcome back to Darkness on the Edge of Town Paranormal Radio, right here on the home of the best in paranormal talk. Every Saturday and Sunday night, join Tim and I as we explore the world of the unexplained and mysterious. We will talk to you every week and talk to experts in the field of everything from ghosts to UFOs, Bigfoot, the Bermuda Triangle, and beyond. We hope that you'll uh, join us here. Remember, if you can't listen to a show live, you can find it easily enough by going to and uh, click on the podcast links. You'll find the Darkness Radio podcast links right there. You can subscribe so you never miss another episode. You can also check out the uh, um, website that we have there, or you can go directly to darknessradio.com as well and get some more information. This evening, we've got an interesting show for you. Um, you don't have to adjust your uh, radio dial. Uh, my voice will sound normal. Our guest is going to be a little altered uh, just for safety's sake. We have a, a gentleman that's joining us, and um, he is going to talk to us about an undisclosed area in Nevada. Is that a good way to put this, Tim? It's a very good way to put it, yeah. yeah. You know, uh, this gentleman worked on part of the Nellis test range in Nevada and uh, had access to certain areas that uh, are not, supposed to be spoken about so we're going to talk to this gentleman uh his name is robert and he's going to be spending the uh, next two hours here on the show with us answering questions about this uh, location and about what what america knows about ufo alien technology and the things that are going on out there so without further ado ladies and gentlemen please help me welcome to the darkness on the edge of town robert good evening sir thanks a lot for spending some time here with us this evening uh joining in and, and answering our questions i appreciate you uh taking this opportunity to be with us well sure thank you very much now, Robert, as I alluded to, you had the opportunity. You worked in a covert area. You worked in a, an undisclosed area in Nevada, and you had access to quite a bit of information while doing this. Now, this was one of those jobs that they fly you in on Monday and fly you back home on Friday. Is that right? Uh, yes, that's correct. A lot of people are going to ask, coming onto a show like this and answering questions, does this open up fears for you, your family, associates, for talking about this type of uh, information, um, uh, not not really. I mean, I uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't I would hope that uh, I wouldn't have to fear about something like this. Um, I think uh, a couple things here just really need to uh, uh, be known to certain people, and uh, but this, and also that uh, I I actually am on the side of uh, the government here, and uh, I think what they're doing is is okay. Well, that that brings out a really great point because a lot of the people in the United States that in the United States believe that there should be more disclosure to American citizens that we should know if we've had contact with aliens if we're reverse engineering alien technology. Now, where I understand from the government's point of view is why should we broadcast to the enemy and to other countries that we've got this highly advanced technology that we're reverse engineering? Um, so I understand the, the secrecy for that, but why do you believe that the rest of the secrecy has to be so harsh, so, so guarded? Uh, I believe it's because uh, perhaps even the rest of the world, including the United States, is not really is re not really ready for it yet. And that's something that I think that we all have to prepare ourselves for. Uh, a lot of it has to do with the different religions and how they fall into place. And, and the big scope of, uh, you know, God creating the planet, or and who's God, but uh, did God create the universe? And you even see the, uh, a lot of the religions starting to expand to that, uh, that theory. And, uh, but I just don't think we're ready for it yet. You know, it's interesting. We just had in the first hour our uh, international correspondent, Adrian Lee, talking about how the Vatican has now opened uh, dialogue in saying that they do believe in aliens and UFO craft and, and technology. So, I mean, we do have religion now starting to take notice of this. And, you know, we've certainly mentioned it on past shows. You know, the Bible even makes reference to UFOs and things that appear in the sky. There are, there are uh, cave paintings. There are hieroglyphs in the Egyptian temples and, and tombs that, that kind of alert us to this. When you took the position doing what you were doing, did you have any trepidation about what you were about to get involved in? Because I would guess, knowing just the history of, of the locations and, and the cloak and dagger appeal of it all, did you have any concern or worry about what you were about to see and that you could never unlearn what you were about to learn? Uh, I would say uh, no. No, not really. I had no, no concerns of like that uh, initially. Sometimes uh, just dealing with weapon systems in themselves, you have some some thought processes that take place uh, and, and bring up some concerns, but uh, when you look at them in, in at least uh, a positive light, uh, that uh, what you're doing in the end is better for mankind than, than it all seems to fit and, and it puts it in its place. 
Robert, can you give us a little background? I don't know if you can do this without revealing too much about yourself, but can you tell us what your level of expertise was that, that they involved you in the workings at this location? I was, uh, I was a contractor, uh, ground engineer for uh, the vehicles that we were testing out there at the time. Uh, many, many uh, people test out there for different reasons and different agencies, and, and I was one of the ground engineers with one of those contractors. A lot of the speculation is that this uh, specific location is, is kind of like a, a, an onion. There's so many different layers and, and things, and what's going on in one area, people are not, you know, even people that are part of that location are not familiar with what's going on in another area, and it, it kind of folds in on itself. So everybody's got a piece of the puzzle, but nobody has put the puzzle together completely. Is Would you say that's a pretty fair assessment? Oh, a very accurate assessment. Everything is pretty much compartmentalized. Uh, of course, when you have the final product, uh, which in most cases I had the final product uh, in what I was doing, then you, you get you get the whole enchilada, if you will. Uh, but yeah, everything is really compartmentalized, and for good reason, too. Um, they keep separations and, in fact, even encourage... Uh, uh, not too much socialization with all the other organizations, just uh, just to keep things uh, a little bit more secure. Well, you alluded when we started talking about you think that there's some things that people should know, and but you're also on the side of the government that there's a lot that that should be protected and and kept. What what would you like, or what do you believe, are some points that you think that America or the world should know and and should have the knowledge of? Um, I, I would say that. Uh, I really think we need to start preparing ourselves for the uh, uh, the eventual meeting of, of a being. Now, I personally have never seen a being myself, but I've seen uh, alien-type aircraft. And uh, so that, that, I mean, that just says a lot there. And, and from my own experience, it's something that I think everybody needs to be prepared for around the world. Do you believe that, that we have... Are, in this in this area that you're working and, and that you had worked, are we being visited there? Are there meetings going on between alien factions and our American government? Um, again, that would be something that I would not would not have been able to or would be privy to. That that would be so such a high level beyond my even level that uh, I would not be included or privy to that sort of information. And uh, I'm saying what I'm saying now based on some of my observations while I was there more so than anything, and then rumor, and any window uh, around uh, uh, such a facility. What, what can you tell us? What did you specifically see? I was, uh, I was privileged to, to get a pretty close hand look at the, the several different alien-type aircraft, and uh, that was kind of mind-blowing. Uh, like I said, I never saw any beams or anything like that, but there was always rumor that three stories down in the secure the area over by headquarters was uh, was where the aliens hung out, and we used to joke about that quite a bit. But uh, I could not uh, I could not say for sure if that was happening or not. Well, here's a question for you then: with with what you saw, the craft that you saw, are you saying that you saw actual what you believe to be alien craft, or is it our technology based on alien craft? I would say it was a combination of both. Yes, a combination of both. So you believe that you've seen total alien technology, and then you've seen the hybrid that we've created ourselves. Yes, correct. Correct. So much speculation in the world of UFO technology is the fact that these things can't just, you know, like our, our craft, we can't stop on a dime and then take off rocketing at a 90-degree angle. With the stuff that you've seen on site there that we're creating, and, and maybe even back engineering is a good t uh, term to follow through on, do we have craft that can, in fact, move that quickly and stop and then reverse and go in different directions? Or is that still part of the alien technology that we have not yet broken through on? I believe that much of that is, uh, is um, it has not been fully developed by us yet. And certainly not within a manned type situation. In an unmanned type situation, it's, it's highly plausible that we could see a lot more radical uh, flight patterns and whatnot uh, than you would with a manned uh, sort of uh, vehicle. Um, I guess I don't know uh, that that's all I can say on that one right now. I'm sorry, I kind of lost you there. No, that's that's fine. Uh, yeah, I just, I, I'm not, 
the curiosity level is just so high with the craft that, that you've been able to see. When it's come in, has it been piloted by alien beings, or is it just a, a, a um, you know, a parked vehicle that you guys have been able to look at and check? Uh, I have seen uh, both piloted and non-piloted manned and un- unmanned uh, alien-type vehicles uh, and in flight. But yet you've never seen the actual creatures that fly these crafts? That's, that's correct. Okay. Well, you know what we're going to do real quickly here, folks. Uh, this time is going to go by fast on us tonight because this is a fascinating subject. You're listening to The Darkness on the Edge of Town Paranormal Radio Show. Our guest is Robert. He's an insider uh, in an uh, undisclosed area in Nevada's desert and uh, has had access to part of the Nellis Test Range. He is here to share with us some of his insights, thoughts, and um, experiences while on this uh, plot of land and, and, and what he was uh, involved in. So stay tuned. You're listening to Darkness Radio. Good evening. Welcome back to the Darkness on the Edge of Town Paranormal Radio Show. I'm your host, Dave Schrader, along with me, my co-host, Tim Dennis. Tim, this is uh, this is interesting. We've got a gentleman on the show with us this evening who has had access to probably one of the most uh, sought-after plots of land in, uh, in the world. People are, are always speculating about what's going on there. Um, he's had access to part of the Nellis Test Range. Mm-hmm. I, I'm watching you across the board, and you've got the quizzical look, and you're doing the the eyebrow thing at me, which I'm so prone to do to you. What uh, what, what kind of questions do you have for Robert, our guest? Well, Robert, just to follow up on last segment, um, you say you've you've seen alien aircraft, but you haven't seen the thing that's actually piloted it. I guess what I want to ask you is, what makes you think that it's alien at all? That it's not just innovations that have been come up with by humans? Um, that's a good question. Um, because it was well, in fact, much of it looked very conventional. Uh, it, it's not the conventional thought of the flying saucer that, that one would expect in these vehicles. They're very, very man-like, uh, very human-like. Um, now, I never got to see up close to the inside of the vehicle. Um, so what the cockpit layout would be like, that would be difficult for me to say what that might be like. Uh, and how that might, well, in our terms, human factors engineering would factor in there. The alien engineering factors in here, and I don't know what that might be. So, yeah, I guess I really, I really don't know only from, no real only explanation from anybody else as to where this technology came from or who developed it. And I know it wasn't, I know it wasn't my company, and I know it wasn't a couple other companies um, that I'm very familiar with. So, and then the, just the hush hush, and you know, I mean, the more you try to quiet something up, the more inquisitive things become, and and. I guess that's what was happening even with us out there, even though we can never get a real good answer on the law of it. Robert, one of the things that I've found intriguing about history is, you know, I mean, it's only been, what, about 100, Tim, 100, 120 years since the innovation of the airplane, right? Mm-hmm. So we've gone from the Wright brothers to moonshots within a 100-year span of time. And during World War II, the Nazis were actually experimenting, and I believe it was prior to even World War II, the Nazis were experimenting with what they called alien technology. They were trying to create a race of spaceships that they thought would be, you know, good to uh, uh, be a more powerful force. So they were already creating then. Now we've had, you know, in that, from the time of Kitty Hawk and the Wright brothers to World War II was a very short span of time, and that they were able to create some of these craft that could lift off the ground. They just had a problem piloting them. But they could get the craft up off the ground. They could move these things around. Now we've had 60, 70 years uh, since you know World War II has taken place. The technology has jumped in leaps and bounds. Could it just be that that we've piloted all of these uh, scientists from around the world? We've we've utilized their equipment. That this isn't alien at all. It's nothing more than just really innovative, as Tim was saying, really innovative stuff that that we've already always had the ability to do. We're just perfecting it as we get you know further along in history. I agree. A lot of that is is the need taking place, uh, and uh, but I have to also go back to uh, thinking like this is how large our universe is, and to to just think that we're like the only ones here that are doing this. Um, it's kind of naive, and like I also, I don't, as you also said, the leap in technology was incredible, absolutely incredible. And uh, I, I have been informed uh, by people on the on the off the record that indeed some of this technology was alien technology. 
So you believe part of the reason we made these large leaps from the 40s on is because we, I mean, it was uh, 40, was it 45 or 46, Tim, with the Roswell crash and incident, correct? 47. Was it? Yeah, it was right in that area. So there was the Roswell crash, which they believe that that was what started the pilot program for being able to back engineer. Do you believe, Robert, then, that, that a lot of our technology that we have today is because of of downed aircraft that, you know, alien crafts like that, that we've been able to re- re- reverse engineer? I personally believe, yes. Uh, I, I've been told that off the record, as I said, and uh, I've been told mainly in areas of propulsion is, is where we, we really gained a lot, and, uh, and in a lot of our unmanned activities as well, uh, air, unmanned air vehicle activity uh, and, uh, and such. Robert, were you told of other areas that we possibly might have alien technology, things like uh, medicinal uh, purposes or, or even the way we do construction, anything like that? Uh, I personally am not familiar with, uh, with any known technology like that. However, a lot of the military technology that we have today is spurned uh, or spurns medical innovations such as the MRI. The MRI itself... Uh, came from anti-submarine technology warfare. Uh, that's basically how we found submarines, the uh, same principle. So the, I guess uh, somehow down the road, in the pipeline, eventually it will end up in, in those shorter uses, but uh, uh, not that I'm fully aware of um, right now. You were part of a, a top-secret program called Skunk Works. What can you tell us about Skunk Works? Uh, Skunk Works is an is a innovative group in, in, uh, based in California. Uh, with Lockheed Corporation, developing uh, advanced, highly advanced, uh, generally prototype type aircraft, proof of concept, for a variety of customers, uh, uh, military, government, uh, uh, small groups, highly compartmentalized, highly experienced, uh, uh, very good, working well with people, the, just the whole plan works together, a very high secure, uh, very easy to get rid of people based on for a security reason, if uh, if they didn't fit, and uh, and it was used uh, uh, for good purpose many times. Is this something that uh, I mean? That was kind of cloak and dagger of an answer. Are you? Is this a way to help uh, vanish people that shouldn't be doing what they're doing? Or uh, yeah, for sure. Yes, yeah, uh, yes. What was your involvement in the Skunk Works project? Again, I was not an engineer. Uh, Skunk Works projects covered a, a broad variety of, uh, of programs, many programs. Uh, meant more than I could even sit down and discuss today. It would take days to actually go through them all and discuss them all, at least a day. So when they have a, a program title like Skunk Works or Project This or Project That, there's more than just, it's it's not like uh, Skunk Works is this project in particular, it's an expanse of projects? Uh, I would say it's, uh, Skunk Works is our, uh, our mascot, if you will, Boeing has the Boeing B. Uh, Douglas, now they all just have acquired uh, Boeing, acquired Douglas, but Douglas had the Phantom Works. So everybody has their own little skunk works, if you will, out there, and they just come by different names, and, and they're in different places with different companies, but they're, they're all trying to achieve the same thing uh, based on funding and programs and, and whatnot. You know, I'm getting questions from the chat room, uh, private messages here that are asking me, to follow up on the question you made earlier, your, your statement about we should be preparing for alien encounter, do you are you fearful of alien invasion or just are, we should be preparing for the aliens making themselves known globally? I, I think that we should be preparing ourselves for uh, the, the aliens making themselves uh, known and present uh, in a friendly manner. Uh, of course, we don't know. Uh, however, I have a pretty good idea. That's, again, that's just based on some some, you know, some talk with some people and, and some ideas and, and theories and theologies and stuff like that. But uh, uh, I, I don't hopefully it's going to be in a friendly fashion, but I believe it is going to be in a friendly fashion. I also believe that's why that's why we in the United States tend to encounter it more. Because if there's any, any continent on the planet that's going to be really accepting of anything like this, I think it's going to be us. Well, we have quite a few sightings of UFOs, but like, there's been a rash for the last, uh, geez, even in just the last month or two, of UFO sightings over um, London, over England, over Cardiff, over 
you know, the European countries, and Mexico has an unbelievable amount of UFO sightings that are taking place there. Now, would you credit that to actual alien technology, or are we out carousing and, and doing a little intel work, and these are our crafts? Um, I would say it's probably a little bit of both. Um, and also getting back to what I was saying before, I, I don't mean just the United States of America. I mean, most, most Western nations and at least those that are, are more open societies uh, would be more accepting of them. And I think that's why we have more chance encounters. Uh, and then going back to the, the signs in Mexico, yeah, I, I, and going all over the world, I believe they're probably uh, both and not necessarily uh, our aircraft or uh, maybe other countries' aircraft. I highly believe that as well. Robert, I have a two-parter here for you to follow up. Um, I'm kind of curious because you said we, we might be more open as far as Western c- countries. I might take a little umbrage with you on that. I mean, aren't we the, the nation that's shoot first and ask questions later and, and uh, quick to go into a conflict that might not necessarily be ours? And this isn't a political view here. This is just an observation that we tend to get involved in a lot of conflicts in the United States military. If we're proactive with our, our weaponry, why would we be the first ones to be trusted or one of the first ones to be trusted with alien technology? And also to follow up with that, why wouldn't a neutral country like Iceland or someone like that uh, be the recipients of alien technology first? Well, uh, it could be that Iceland was the first recipient of it, and they've given it to us. I mean, I think it, it would be, because Iceland is pretty much an ally of ours. I mean, it, it, well, for instance, it, it, look at what happened in Kampustinar uh, over in Russia when the UFOs were flying over their secret base there. They just went ballistic, and they just shot them all down, too. Now, I don't know that that would take place here. Uh, so rapidly. I think we, we in more Western civilized countries, uh, tend, tend to look uh, for non-violence before violence. Uh, and uh, I just, uh, you know, if, uh, if something like uh, a UFO landed, say, in, in Afghanistan, what do you think the, 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 uh, the outcome would be? I don't know that they'd sit around and wait for somebody to come out and shake their hand. So, I, you know, I think that really uh, Western society is probably going to be uh, the uh, greeting point somewhere. I mean, it could, uh, even Japan, uh, China, I don't know about that. That might be a little risky right now. Uh, but uh, Japan or uh, the United States, South America, Europe, uh, but uh, totalitarian nations aren't really accepting of, uh, of alien technology or religion or anything else for that matter. It's their way of the highway. Well, let's take our second break here. You're listening to The Darkness on the Edge of Town Paranormal Radio Show. Our guest is Robert. He has had uh, access to uh, an undisclosed location in Nevada that's pretty well known and has also been part of the Nellis Test Range. We're going to be back with more of your questions and more of ours. Good evening. Welcome back to the Darkness on the Edge of Town Paranormal Radio Show. Before we get into our guest again, I want to make a quick mention to you. Tim and I are interested. um, One of our sponsors on the show is digitaldowsing.com. Bill Chappell has created some of what we believe to be some of the most innovative paranormal uh, ghost hunting technology on the field. And uh, for those of you that have purchased this equipment and own it, we would like you to weigh in. Uh, Start sending us emails at dave at darknessradio.com. If you're getting strange uh, information either back from the Ovilus or from the Paranormal Puck, we'd love to hear about it for an upcoming episode. We'd like to have you on the show. We're going to share that information, share your personal stories with the Ovilus and the Paranormal Puck. We want to put it to the test and see what you think of this type of equipment. So again, Check out digitaldowsing.com. If you haven't already purchased this equipment, uh, it's something I would recommend. It's a very affordable piece of equipment that uh, I think every team should be experimenting with. Uh, I don't say that just because they're a sponsor of our show, but because I believe in the product myself, and I think it's an amazing piece of equipment. So check it out and uh, get back to Tim and I. You can email me again at dave at darknessradio.com with your evidence and with your stories. We'd love to hear it. Getting back into tonight's show, we are speaking to Robert, and Robert is talking to us. Again, you don't have to adjust your your radio dial. His voice is distorted for his protection, and um, he's sharing some information, some sensitive information about uh, his time, uh, about 10 years that he spent on an undisclosed location in the middle of the Nevada desert uh, and his access to part of Nellis Test Range, talking to us about the different uh, technology, um, possible alien craft, and and things that he's he's seen and, and personally dealt with. Before we went to the break, Tim, you brought up a question mm-hmm. of why would they come to us where the shoot first, ask questions later kind of guy. Mm-hmm. If, in fact, they've been in contact with us as it's surmised 
all the way back through the 40s. Mm-hmm. Maybe, you know, we weren't a, a shoot first and ask questions later kind of country. We, we were pretty standalone. We didn't, you know, we didn't go into uh, World War II until they came to us and they had to drop bombs on us and, and bring us into this war. So we weren't quick to jump into a lot of the conflicts. We were we were dragged into the conflict. Well, we were isolationists, but but up but, until but my World point War is II. maybe the reason now that we're so aggressive is as the old saying you know goes, absolute power corrupts absolutely. We were more of an innocent nation when we got this engineering and this uh, this information and craft and and work. Now, I mean, let's face it, America, we're a pompous country. We're we're an egotistical country that. You know, we believe we, we are a superpower, and we like to lord it over people. But see, I can argue, too, that that the United States didn't go into World War I willingly either. But they went because they were dragged into it. Right. Once they were there, they did a pretty good job of dominating. Right. Exactly. But my point is, I'm you were saying that we were could... aggressive. We weren't aggressive. We were aggressive when we were brought into it. So at that time, and that's around the time that... that it's believed, you know, in the early 40s when the alien technology started coming our way, it might have been because we were not so aggressive. We weren't out there trying to shoot things out of the sky. We weren't, you know, it wasn't shoot first, ask questions later back then. It was it was a, a, a moment of exploration. And now that we've possibly partnered with these alien beings, now that we have that technology, we've become more aggressive. Now we're quicker to jump in. Why? Because if the bleep hits the fan... We know we've got the the support to back us to go in there. You know, I mean, uh, you know, we haven't really had to deal with the thick of it yet. And I was going to actually ask uh, Robert about that. I mean, uh, Robert, out, out of what we were just stating and talking about, do you have any feelings or thoughts on, on that subject at all? Um, well, geez, uh, that, yeah, you guys had a lot going on there from World War One to now. And, uh, you know, the place for the technology could have been pure luck. Um, technologies again uh, could have been pure luck the first time and follow ups in, in or, or uh, you know going back on those same tracks a second third time from whoever it was that was coming to visit us um, and could have just been pure luck and we could have gotten this technology from other people too that they didn't know what to do with it uh, so they asked us for help and that's how we got it uh, I'm not just exclusively saying that we deserve it because we're the United States of America but uh I sure am happy that that we are getting a piece of the action rather than some other people. But do you think that maybe part of the reason we've become more aggressive as a country and we're willing to interject ourselves in our policies and and start to lord over other countries with our principles is because we know we have the technology that if it if it comes down to the bloody mess again, we have the the ability to go in there and kind of wipe the slate clean with the technology that we've incurred. Do you think that might be part of why we are more why we feel we're a stronger nation now because we have that backing us? Well, I suppose to a certain extent that's going to be a factor, uh, as in the peace, peace through strength uh, philosophy, which I, I do believe in, uh, actually. But uh, um, I, I, I'm sorry, I just guess it's a factor in probably anything. You know, you like to go into a fight knowing that you're going to have at least a half a chance. All right. And, Tim, you had a follow-up question for Robert? Well, just said... <clears throat> Again, we'll go. We'll we'll go with the war scenario. You go from the '40s, World War II, to the first Roswell crash, to all of a sudden you're involved in Korea, in the Cold War with uh, the Soviet Union, and eventually Vietnam. If we had this technology throughout the years, or we're perfecting it, why are we aiming nukes at each other with the Soviet Union for years and years? Why in the Vietnam conflict where we were where we using Agent Orange? Why were there different things that, uh, why were we using different things and not this, you know, again, I don't know what kind of alien technology we had, but, or, or what it could do, but wouldn't it seem to you that, why would we take so many steps that were outside the convention of technology that could be used easier and more efficiently to, to govern or to work out conflicts than, in other words, why not show our hand? Why not, why not just say, we have it, don't mess with us? Why? Um, yeah, that, that, that's, that's a good question. Um, uh, my train of thought here on this is, uh, well, gosh, hold on a second, I lost it. Um, okay, I don't believe that the technology back in the day was nearly as refined as it is today. And uh, so, therefore, I don't think that it, it would have been much practical use to us. Although I do have to say we were a couple 
couple days ahead in the in the in the atomic bomb. I mean, let's not forget that Germany was going to drop on us and on us until they couldn't get enough uh, uh, heavy water. Um, Japan, uh, they were they went they went into a battle with us, knowing that they couldn't win, but they went to do it anyway. And I would have justified using nukes there too because they were going to fight to the last man. And after going into the islands that we did go into, and after finally going into Japan, they said that they were not they were going to die. And we would have lost an additional million people, million guys. Um, and then also as a result of that war, and being the two bombs dropped, uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, from that point on, the United States says it will never ever release a weapons system ever again until it has some sort of way to counter it. So regardless of how one thinks the outcome of all the nuclear technology and what happens, uh, came out, we actually got a really good positive out of that. And that is that our country will not, will not release any weapon system unless it has some form of counter. Uh, and that's not announced very much. That's also an insight type thing. This is why the F-117 was held back for many years. A lot of stealth technology was held back for years and years because we had no way to counter it. So we're not just reckless in our thoughts and throwing around our weapon systems, not as we once were. Sure, we have a lot of cleaning up to do and, and you know, and uh, looking in our own backyard and taking care of ourselves and our own people. But, uh, again, I'm glad we're, we're some of the people that are privy to some of the information that we hold. Do you believe that we are far off from full-on global alien contact from the things that you've seen and the things you know and, and the rumors that you've heard working at that location? Do you believe that within the next 15, 20, 30 years, the aliens are going to make themselves known to everyone and not just government officials? God, I, I, you know, it's hard to say with the way the world is today with all the, all the problems in the world today. I don't, you know, it just makes me less... Uh, optimistic that that anything in that direction can happen unless again we're at the point of annihilation where we're going to totally destroy the planet and it's going to take something like this for 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 us to become friends and work together uh, around the world but gosh i don't know that's a tough one i don't see that happening soon based on the way i view the world today so you think the aliens won't make themselves known to us because of the aggressive stance and nature that the world is in right now? Uh, yeah, and I don't mean the United States. I mean other countries. I mean, look at the Sudan. Uh, look at, uh, well, you know, the, look at the countries in the Middle East that, that, that uh, the women don't have free rights. I mean, yeah, it may have only been recently in this country where women got rights, but they have rights. Uh, so now that, that an alien have a right, a dog doesn't have a right in those countries. In a lot of countries, uh, are the aliens going to have a right and make peace? Uh, I don't think so. Let's take our, our uh, last break of the, of the first hour here. You're listening to Darkness on the Edge of Town Paranormal Radio Show. We'll be back with more. Welcome back to the Darkness on the Edge of Town Paranormal Radio Show. I'm your host, Dave Schrader. This evening, we're spending our time with Robert, and Robert is... Uh, Privy to information, he had uh, worked for around 10 years at an undisclosed location in Nevada and uh, had access to the part of the Nellis test range. And he is here sharing his insights and thoughts on uh, what he experienced during his time there. Again, Robert, thanks for spending some time with us this evening and, uh, and answering our questions. You're welcome. I'm, you know, as, as we were talking, you said that we should prepare, you know, that eventually we're going to have this global communication um, I just asked you if you think it's going to happen in the next 20 to 30 years. You said you think with the stance of the world the way it is right now, probably not. Uh, how do we prepare for something? And do you really, uh, you know, I mean, it's kind of a contradictory statement almost. You know, we should be getting ready and preparing, uh, but getting ready and preparing for something that won't happen in our lifetime. How do we do that? Well, it's, uh, I mean, it's like religion itself. It's something that's going to take time and it's going to take uh, understanding. Um, it's going to take actions by people, uh, the rest of the world, everybody's going to have to, we need to start thinking of us as, as, as all humans more so than, than, than one group or another, uh, fighting each other or killing each other over religion or, or, or theologies and thoughts. So, uh, I would like to think that it would happen, but I also see, I see religion starting to go in that direction, as we mentioned at the beginning of the program. Uh, I think the earlier on president, present president, uh, George Bush, uh, told us or uh, alluded to uh, 
us um, preparing ourselves. Um, so I, I think it's slowly, slowly taking hold. But will it be a full blown? Uh, unless, unless we're in the face of annihilation, I don't know that it's that it will happen uh, in my, my lifetime. So many people are focused on the aircraft that we've engineered or reversed engineered from alien technology. Can you tell me, is it, I mean, is that not the even the most impressive part? It, with the weapon systems that you know about and are privy to, are, do we have amazing technology that nobody even knows about at this point weapon-wise? And, and is it something that you think is going to be implemented quicker in battle scenarios? Or is this something that's going to be held off for if there's ever another World War II type scenario that goes down? Oh, gosh, the technology that, we've, that we, we employ today, uh, and much of it is, is derived from the sources that we discussed earlier. Yeah, the sources are, are really, uh, really uh, phenomenal. I mean, I believe one of the atomic bomb scientists, uh, we're talking about Star Wars, and Ronald Reagan, they call Ronald Reagan Star Wars a uh, fact, a uh, fiction, uh, just comic book stuff. Uh, we, at that time, in the, who were privy to it, knew that that Star Wars would work, and well, here we are today, and we're about, we're about ready to do it. And uh, actually, we have, in, in several different ways. We did it back with when Ronald Reagan was president. We opened up a, when we opened up a, uh, an intercontinental balloon, an ICBM in outer, in outer space, and opened it up like a tin can while we disabled its navigation system. That's when the Soviets came and the wall came down. So yeah, I mean, and I also agree with the peace through strength thing, uh, and that's just human nature. And I have lots of other stories I could, I could tell you guys about that, uh, not dealing, uh, not being uh, a peace through strength advocate. Uh, if you, if you're gonna, think that everybody's a nice guy and want to be just nice to you all the time, that's, that's, a, that's a myth. So you need to be tough and everybody needs to respect each other and know that if something goes wrong, you know what, you might get back. Well, let me ask you this, Robert. Let's, let's go back a second. You said that we'd, uh, we've perfected the Star Wars system, which is essentially knocking missiles out of, out of orbit or out of space or out of their, off of their target. And that essentially was the fall of communism. Wouldn't the fall of communism in the Soviet Union been been chalked up to economic terms, or is that just a line we were given? Well, that's uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, that's that's uh, part of it. Is the, the, economically, that's how we won the war. Is uh, Reagan knew that the Soviets could not keep up with the spending uh, to keep up with the defense systems because they were so far behind, and we were so far ahead. So we basically bankrupt them in that respect. My fear today is that we <laughs> China might do it without a shot. So. Uh, uh, we got different times, and uh, but yeah, I, I mean, our technology has really helped us in the past, and it, and it will in the future, and, uh, and thank goodness. What's to stop, let's say, a, a, a nation like I, Iran, a nation that right now is is hostile but up and coming in the economic world, or up and coming in their arms race? What's to stop them from getting a hold of the type of technology you're talking about, or these type of advancements? Um, I, I, I don't think, I don't think that that'll ever happen. I, I think that they could come close, let's put it that way. Now, of course, with nuclear weapons, your basic high school physicist student could take, could build one, I could build one, get the instructions off the internet. So that's not the achievable thing, but the technology behind it and delivering the systems, that's where the, that's where the trick lies today. Uh, otherwise it's low tech, anybody could do a, a suitcase bomb or anything like that. Now, those are also big threats, don't get me wrong. Uh, and those are things that we also have to focus on, but uh, we, we we also need to to have a balanced a balanced um, system out there for all types of threats, from low tech to high tech. A lot of low tech things that we, that, like a suitcase bomb. Again, we derive that though from high tech applications. So that's why I think we always have to shoot for the highest applications and use the best technologies available, so that we can come back and use it for more simpler things. And as I said, thank goodness that we had this technology made available to us. There's a weapon system out there right now. It's being tested by the military. That has to do with, I'm trying to remember if it's microwaves or sonar, where it's used for crowd control. Have you heard of this? Where it, it hits you and it feels like your skin is heating up underneath. Um. Yes, I've heard of that. There, 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 there's many different uh, types of more crowd control, which is, this also bothers me a little bit. Who are they going to use it on? I hope it's not us, but uh, <laughs> we better watch it. Uh, no, but yeah, there's a technology out there where they use, micro, well, they, they use bursts of energy, and it makes you feel like you're on fire. 
Yeah, that's one that you also use audio. Uh, tones that will just deafen you and drive you mad. Um, there's another one out there, I don't know, it feels like somebody just punches you. Uh, there's, so there's several different types of applications like that that will, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm curious, you know, you mentioned that you think that they are going to hold off because of the aggressive stance and nature of, of the world. But doesn't that also, I mean, if they have the ability to bend space and time and travel great distances to get to us and we're reverse engineering their technology and we're reverse engineering their um, weapon systems, uh, why are they worried about us? Why are they worried about, I mean, they should be able to come here and disable us pretty quickly if they already have that far, you know, advancements in their own technology fields. Sure, I agree. They may not be all that worried about annihilating this or wanting to fight with us even for that matter. And some might be here from, you know, like I said, there may be variants. Uh, there might be um, jubilants from one place and op octopuses from another and <laughs> and plantonians from someplace else. And they all have different agendas, uh, which could be, uh, uh, I don't, but I don't necessarily, I mean, from what I know, uh, I, I don't know that anybody uh, has come to us in harm, but I don't know that because I don't know that somebody's lived or a being has been there to communicate with. I've heard about it. Let me ask you this. When you first got there and you f first saw your uh, first UFO and your first contact with that, seeing a, 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 an alien craft, you knew that was an alien craft coming over towards you, how did that affect you personally? I mean, I don't know how. I, I, I saw something two years ago that I still can't wrap my head around. Um, I'm, I'm just curious, what, how do you process that as a human being? Well, some of the, some things that I have seen, like you, I've seen, I don't have an, ex, an explanation for them, uh, and I'm 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 pretty uh, pretty good at this sort of thing. Uh, and and then there are those that uh, I have seen that I that were that I knew we were involved with, and uh, I kind of a spiritual type experience, and and and, and walking away and thinking more about it, and saying, oh my gosh. Dude, we, we got it wrapped. <laughs> we got it, man. This is it. You know, we're the we're the men. <laughs> and uh, and I don't mean that to 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 boast or anything like that, but it's it's kind of a a, a good feeling about 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 us as human beings in, in this country and how we feel. Well, we're going to take our final break uh, of this hour. We're going to go to the top of the hour break. We have news coming up, and then we'll be back with more with Robert. So everybody stay tuned. You're listening to 100.3 K-Talk. And also do me a favor, remember tomorrow, or on, on Monday rather, the 29th, uh, we are going to uh, be on um, uh, Paranormal State on A&E Channel. Dave Schrader, I'll be out at the Gilliland Ranch doing a UFO investigation with the cast of Paranormal State. I hope you'll check that out. Again, it's on Monday the 29th, A&E. Check your local listings for times.